Episode 8, Bitcoin White Paper, Part 5, Nodes and Decentralization, recorded 8th of November, 2019. This is Bitcoin Basics Podcast with your host Ferris, that's me, and Gordon from Coin Compass. We're Bitcoin advisors and educators supporting business and individual investors to safely buy, manage, and control their private keys, Bitcoins. Visit coincompass.com for more information. This podcast is strictly educational and is not intended to be financial or investment advice. Full disclaimer in the show notes and at the end of this episode. Now, there's one word in here, Gordon, I'd like to explain, and that is the word nodes. Yeah, a node is simply a device, a computer. So back in the day when you could mine CPU, uh, mine with a CPU on your laptop, your laptop is a node. So one device, one node running the software. And because Bitcoin is open source, you go to Bitcoin.org, download the Bitcoin software and run it on your laptop. Nowadays, as we said, it's really expensive to run a Bitcoin miner because of electricity and the hardware. A Bitcoin pool might be made up of 200, 500, 1000 nodes. And going back to the point before, the longest chain, and as long as someone isn't attacking the network and there are ways to do these double spends. There are ways to censor transactions, delete chan- transactions, change transactions. The longest chain will prevail. Bitcoin actually does split several times a day. So for example, Faris, if you're in China, you're a Bitcoin miner, and I'm in America, I'm a Bitcoin miner, we could potentially solve this puzzle at exactly the same time. What happens is you solve the puzzle every 10 minutes and you solve the puzzle first, or you think it's first, your node connects to other nodes around China and spreads throughout Asia. I'm in America, say I'm in North America. I solve the puzzle at exactly the same time. My node connects to other nodes around South America. Eventually, within five, maybe 10 seconds, that will spread throughout, throughout the Bitcoin network. And what we might have is what is called a chain split. So we have solved, we're both Bitcoin miners. We're not attacking the network. We're doing proof of work. We've solved the puzzle at exactly the same time. But we can't have two chains in Bitcoin. We need to decide, well, which chain is the right chain. When you solve the puzzle, it also produces a timestamp. And that timestamp is very specific. It goes down to the millisecond. But there could be a case where we also have the same timestamp as well. Eventually, though, what will happen is the network will be something like 50.1% and 49.9%, whatever the longest chain that's what the Bitcoin network will actually go to. So for example, if I solve it even at the same time as you, but I'm connected to more nodes and more nodes recognize my chain, therefore my chain will be recognized. And unfortunately, all the work that you've done on your chain will be completely discarded. And actually this happens legitimately a couple of times a day. And it might not only be in one block, sometimes there are four or five blocks and Miners are mining on different chains for, say, 30 minutes or 50 minutes. But eventually the Bitcoin network splits, then it gets back together again. Then it splits and then it gets back together again. So that's what it talks about, this longest chain. Uh, That is a chain where all the miners recognize as the Bitcoin blockchain. So I suppose this leads into our next sentence as well. The network itself requires minimal structure. So it's dynamic and it's basically figuring itself out as it goes along, which um, chain do we go with? And keep in mind, it's been doing this for 10 years now. Now, our last sentence here in the abstract is messages are broadcast on a best effort basis and nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the longest proof of chain as proof of what happened while they're gone. So this is exactly what um, Gordon just explained. The blocks are mined, transactions are verified. It's done on a best effort basis. Nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will. So, okay, say that first transaction was mine in China, and then Gordon found it at the exact same time in America. The network can go with my transaction, but then it can go, hang on, the transaction that Gordon verified is now a longer chain. So miners will jump onto Gordon's chain, thereby that becomes part of the Bitcoin blockchain. So this is really where Bitcoin is working with market forces and what we really call uh, game theory. It's something I recommend you look into because from an economic perspective, this is to me the world's first undiluted market that has not been influenced by a central authority. 
And even though this is not mentioned in the abstract, I think it's really important that we explain the difference between centralized and decentralized. So as we alluded to earlier on, uh, the cash that you have in your wallet, that's come from a central authority. The money that you have in your bank is controlled by one bank, a central authority. So Gordon, what is decentralized? If we had, for example, 10 people connected to the Bitcoin network, myself, Faris, and some of our friends, then something like a 51% attack would be pretty easy to do. You'd need six out of the 10 to be doing something malicious or attacking the network. But instead of having 10 Bitcoin miners, let's replace that with a million Bitcoin miners. So you had a million Bitcoin miners in every country in the world, every city in the world, using different internet connections, running different laptops, different servers. You would have to have 500,001 500, miners attacking the network that is decentralized because you wouldn't, for example, know where those miners were and you wouldn't be able to control their mining equipment. Decentralized works because there isn't a central server. So again, my analogy of using websites, facebook.com, google.com, twitter.com is a central server. It is not decentralized. Bitcoin network works because you have this peer-to-peer -peer computers or what we call nodes connecting to each other and in here it says if nodes go offline if i go on holidays for two weeks that's fine the network will simply ignore my nodes so nodes come and go from the network they go online they go offline the more nodes you have the more decentralized a network is going to be it's simply a gradient between centralized and decentralized I don't think you could have something that is fully decentralized because there are always going to be companies and there are major mining companies that control a lot of the mining power or hashing power. But if you have individuals and companies, both, the more miners you have that are independent of each other, the more decentralized the network becomes. And again, that comes back to the game theory. So one example I like to think of decentralized, um, if you look at your bank, so let's just say you have all your funds with Acne Bank Incorporated. And I'm just making one up here because I don't want to pick on anyone specifically. So I'm hoping there is no Acne Bank Incorporated out there. So they've got your uh, information, your identity, and all your funds there. From a hacker's point of view, they just need to hack that one mainframe, that computer attached to that one bank. With Bitcoin, it's different. So let's think of that building, right? So with a bank, you're attacking one property, one house. With Bitcoin, because there's no central bank, it's basically laptops around the world in several hundred countries around the world, several different computers, you would actually have to attack every single laptop at the same time. So what Bitcoin is, is you could look at it as a new internet or the internet of money. We're not using the archaic or computers and internet to transfer money. We're using the processing power in our mobile phones, in our computers to create a new financial system where we can transfer funds from one party to another without going through a trusted third party, a bank that can easily be hacked. Yeah, I think decentralized, the best way to explain it is the internet. Uh, someone wants to stop the internet. Someone says, you know, country X is blocking the internet. People always find a way around it, whether they use satellite, whether they use Bluetooth, whether they use other kinds of technologies. There is no way to actually stop it. There's no way to hack it. Thanks for watching or listening. Please visit coincompass.com slash free to register to our socials and discover other free content. Subscribing, liking and following helps this content remain ad free. Until next time. Disclaimer. Any content provided by Coin Compass or the Bitcoin Basics podcast is for educational and informational purposes only and is not investment, legal, tax, or any other professional advice. A qualified professional should be consulted before making any financial decisions. Coin Compass or the Bitcoin Basics podcast will at times recommend certain products, services, and technologies, but these are opinions based upon our own or podcast guests' experience and not endorsements. We take no liability for out-of-date or inaccurate information, software bugs, manufacturing errors, technology misuse, or issues involving third parties. Visit coincompass.com for more information and please contact us.